Amen. Shall we have a word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we want to glorify your holy name this morning. We give you all the glory for your faithfulness, for your mercy, and for all the good things you do in our lives. We thank you for another day like this. And we thank you for the opportunity to stand before the presence of your precious children and to share what you have given unto us. This morning, we call upon the presence of the Holy Spirit to take absolute control over this discussion. May your name forever be praised, O God. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Shall we be seated? This morning, by the special grace of God, I want to thank the convener of this program for the opportunity to be in your midst. In the next short period ahead of us, we are going to discuss something very, very important. And it is about our mind. When we talk about the mind, it is that part of the human body that senses, perceives, imagines, thinks, wills, remembers, and reasons. For this, we can say that the human mind is the engine of the human being. All actions are taken by what the mind dictates to us. But in the realm of development and achievement, it is how you allow your mind to play out that determines who you will become. And that is why the organizers of this program have deemed it fit for us to discuss all, this all-important topic. I've told you about the mind. And you know that in mathematics, when we talk about the set, it is something that holds elements. The set is a collection of different things. So the mind is the set of your life. And all the things that I've mentioned play in that set. So how you allow the members of this set of your mind to play out is what we are going to discuss this morning. It could be something positive or negative. And that is what brings us to this day's discussion. But before we go into our discussion, I want us to start by understanding two fundamental things, which is our topic, fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Can we all say it? Some of you are not paying attention. Pay attention. We are discussing fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Shall we all say it? God bless you. Before then, I want you to take a moment and look deep inside you and think about a challenge you have faced in life. Think about how you approached it. What came to your mind at the time that you were at that critical position? In that moment, what came into your mind? What kind of mindset did you have at the time? And what was the effect of the outcome? Think deep. Now, the activity we are going to have is that you are going to share that experience with yourself. And what I want you to do is that if you are sure that you had a positive mindset, a growth mindset, and therefore the outcome, the result of the action you took was good, then give yourself a smile. I want to see those who are smiling. But if you know that at that critical moment of your life, 
the decision you took didn't end well with you, then be yourself as we continue with this discussion. The wisest man that ever lived on this earth once said that you are what you think. So what your mind tells you, if you follow it, you become it. That is why the great lawyer in the Bible told us that we need to be renewed in our minds. Now, looking at our topic, it is important for us to understand what we are talking about. Fixed mindset. What does it actually mean? It is the belief that your abilities are static and cannot be changed. You might also believe that success comes solely from talent and intelligence with no need for effort. What this means is that your mind tells you that this thing you can't do, so don't go near it. Your mind is fixed about a certain situation. It may be influenced by our upbringing. It may be influenced by our society. It may be influenced by our culture. It may be influenced by the kind of association we have. Whatever it may be, if you lock up your mind that this is where I stand, even though it is not good, but that is me, so let it be forever and you never move forward. So that is what we mean when we talk about somebody with a fixed mind. Contrary to that, the person with a growth mindset is the one, or the growth mindset is the belief that talents and abilities can be developed over time through dedication and hard work. This mindset holds that anyone can improve their intelligence and skills through effort. Some people think that some people are born great. It may be true, but we know that there are other people who also learn. I always tell people that we have never seen, maybe it's yet to happen, that somebody was born with a book in the brain. If you have seen some before, can I see your hand? You saw a baby born with a book in the brain. I'm not seeing any hand. So it means we've not seen some before. I met an 18-year-old girl who was sweeping somebody's house for patents. And I asked her, why are you not in school? Do you know what he said? In Akan, he said, meaning he doesn't do well in school. That is why she herself has decided to stay out of school. At that time, she was 18 years. And I told her, you will go back to school because it is you telling yourself that you are not competent for education. But that is not what God has said concerning you. So you go back to school. He went to school and he was placed in class two. 18 years in class two. And with time, this girl, by encouragement, was able to complete her primary, her JSS, and went to the secondary school. That is what God can do. That is what a growth mind can do. At first, he had a fixed mindset. He, she told herself she can't. But when she had encouragement, he switched to a growth mindset and told herself, even though I'm the oldest in this class, I will humble myself and learn and go through the process. And that was how she was able to change her world. So the question I want to ask is that, think deep. Have you ever seen or heard, or can you think of any famous person who embodies a growth mindset? How has this mindset contributed to the person's success? I believe you may be able to tell one or two. 
I want to talk to you, give you an example of a woman I have studied about. And this woman is Merkel, um, Angela Merkel. This woman had a lot of limitations. Number one, she herself was a woman. And she was the daughter of a pastor. She also was involved in the most male-dominated profession. However, this woman didn't allow any of these things to limit her. But she decided to develop a growth mindset. And she succeeded. Do you know what? In the whole world, that is the woman who had, for four consecutive times, been elected as a chancellor in Germany. In Germany, when they say a chancellor is like a prime minister, or in our own country, the head of state. So this woman has served for 16 consecutive years. And she was said to be the most powerful woman in the whole world. She didn't allow her limitations to overcome her. And that was how she was able to scale through to become successful. Not wasting time. I want us to look at some of the characteristics that depicts a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset avoids challenges. Their thoughts are always, what if I don't succeed? What if uh, I'm not able to go through? What if people that, uh, don't like what I'm doing? What if the negative happens? That is how those people think. They give up easily. You see, when there is a mountain or there's a hill ahead of you, and there is something behind the hill or mountain that you need for your life, the fixed mindset will say that, oh, I wanted to go over there to take this thing or to collect this thing that will help me. But then, because of the mountain, I can't do it. This morning, I believe that there are some people who yesterday have decided to be here. But because of the drizzling of the rain, they have stayed home. Oh, I had wanted to go. But it is raining. So they are not here. Let's bless the name of the Lord because you are here and you are going to see, receive something special for your life this morning in Jesus' name. Those with fixed mind, they don't want to have feedback. Whatever they do, whether you like it or not, take it like that. Don't give any feed feedback. Because the feedback, if it doesn't go well with what they have done, they are discouraged. They feel threatened by other people's successes. When they see that somebody has succeeded in one thing or the other, then they feel bad about it. They are lucky. They are moving forward. And for me, I am here. Nothing is working for me. Hmm, I will not associate with them because um, they are just moving. And because I can't move like they are moving, just let me be at my own corner. And those people focus on outcomes over the effort. So they don't even want to put in the little effort. They have to. But then, what if I start and I'm not able to end? What if I, I do it and I don't succeed? That is how they think. They avoid risk. They are risk averse. They don't want anything that would disturb their peace of mind. They don't want to fight. They, want, they don't want to stretch beyond their limits. They downplay effort. They believe that life is all about innate abilities. If you have the capacity to do a high jump, fine. He can't jump, she can't jump, so it's okay. If you have the capacity to fly above the moon, that is fine. But she, she knows she can't do it, so she will stay where she is. So these people are always afraid of failure. Now let's look at some characteristics that depict a growth mindset. The growth mindset always embraces challenges. He might never have handled that before, but she will tell herself, she will tell, he will tell himself 
Let me try. I will try. I will put in my effort. I will do the best I can and see how it becomes. So they cherish their efforts. They learn from people's criticisms. So they are not afraid of attempting something. They will do it because they know that when they go wrong and they are criticized, they will be able to learn from it. They persist through the obstacles. No matter, they are the people that if the mountain is obstructing them, they will find a way around it. They will either find a way of climbing it or digging a hole through the mountain to get to the other side. They will never allow the mountain to prevent them from getting what they wish for. They are inspired by others', others successes. When they hear the stories of achievers, they are inspired and they want to do more. They cultivate curiosity because they want to do more. They want to learn more. They know that they don't know. So they, they, they acquire knowledge that will help them to know what they don't know. They set goals for themselves and make sure they implement the goals smartly, as our earlier speaker said, and they make sure that they are evaluating what they are, they are, the actions that they are putting in place and improving on whatever they are doing. They practice reflection. When they do something, they sit back and look at it, just as God did. After creation, God sat back and saw that whatever he has done was very good. They surround themselves with people with growth mindset. At times, individually, we may have a growth mindset. But because we have surrounded our peop ourselves with people with fixed mindsets, it doesn't help us to develop our growth mindset. And eventually, we sink down to fixed mindset. Lastly, the growth mindset adopts positive attitude towards failure. Yes, he knows he has failed. But is he going to allow that to bring him or her that low? No. He will sit back and learn. He will ask questions. How can I do this thing well? And by that, he is able to improve on himself or herself. I want us to look at how these two sets of people think. The fixed mindset will say that I want to avoid making mistakes. But the growth mindset will say that mistakes help me to learn. The more he makes mistakes, the more he's learning, the more he's improving, the more he's moving forward. Number two, the fixed mindset will say, I'll never be that smart. I will never be that smart. But the growth mindset will say that I improve with practice. He always wants to practice. Yes, I did it yesterday. It didn't go well. Today, I will practice on my own. Tomorrow, I will do it again and see the improvement I have. Number three, the fixed mindset will say, I know best. They know everything. They know it all. So they are not ready to listen and to learn something new. But the growth mindset will say, feedback is valuable for me. Tell me what I need to know. Maybe I don't, I don't know that I don't know. So tell me so that I'll be able to know. That is the growth mindset. Number four, the fixed mindset will say that I give up. But the growth mindset never give up. The fixed mindset will say, this is good enough. I have done my best. I'm not ready to fight forward. I'm not ready to move ahead. I'm not ready to push ahead. But the growth mindset will say that, is this my best work? Did I put in the best of my effort? That is how a growth mindset will think. Now, putting these two mindsets together, we realize that the fixed mindset has a locked mindset from the de definition that we, we had earlier. Their minds are locked like a locked padlock. But on the other hand, the growth mindset on the other hand, the growth mindset is a product that grows. It's just like a tree. 
So what it means is that, or what I want all of us to understand is that the mind is like a field. Anything at all can drop on it, whether consciously or unconsciously. But you as an individual will have to determine which one you prefer. My dear friends, there are dangers in having a fixed mindset. A fixed mindset. There are dangers in it. When the prodigal son had a fixed mindset, I believe that the family advised him, but he never took to any advice. And he ran to that far country, and that was how, how he, be, he became virtually destroyed until he came to himself. So the fixed mindset has little or no progress in his life. He is content with whatever, whatever comes his way. And eventually, he is disgraced and destroyed. There, there are certain things we need to know to help ourselves grow or cultivate a growth mindset. It demands hard work. Just as a tree planted, you have to plant the seed. You have to water it. You have to care for it by putting in manure. You have to maintain it by weeding around it. And that is how your mindset will grow. So if you have a growth mindset, this is the idea. What are the things I need to improve on this idea? From the, from the discussions we just had, some are entrepreneurs. They were saying that whatever God has planted in you, just put it into practice. And as you practice it, you learn more. Be intentional about your actions. And as you are intentional, you know where you are moving from this point to. And that is what helps you. You have to be creative and innovative. Whatever God lays on your heart to do, just start it anyhow, anywhere, by any means. And as you start, you realize that more ideas will be coming. You have to focus on the effort and learn more. The little you can, just put it into action and learn more to add to what you know already. Embrace challenges and be ready that you will make mistakes, but that is how you will grow. Celebrate your progress. Of course, you deserve it. So when you make progress, celebrate it and look forward to how best you can improve on your progress. Think positively about yourself. Don't be negative about yourself. Don't say that me, I am a poor person. I come from a poor background, and therefore there's nothing I can do for myself. The growth mindset is very important in shaping your future. I am going to use the name of somebody as an acronym for how important growth mindset is. And when I am done, you are, go you are going to tell me that name. Number one, journey of continuous improvement leads to growth and success. Journey of a, of, uh, of a continuous improvement leads to growth and success. Number two, effort leads to mastery. When you put in your effort, you become a master of that particular activity. Skill, development, and adaptability make you employable. If you are not developing your skills, if you are not adapting to situations and learning more things to add to what you know already, you cannot be employed in this modern world when many graduates are not yet employed. Skill development and adaptability make you employable. Unleash creativity and innovation. That is the importance of a growth mindset. It will help you to find unique solutions. One of the panelists was telling us that look at your environment, look within your community, find a problem, and think outside the box to find how you will be able to give a solution to that particular problem. Sustained success and confidence produces growth and progress. So I want you to tell me the name we have used to understand how important growth mindset is. What name is it? Can we shout the name loud? Another loud one. So I am here to tell you, my dear friend, that it is only Jesus that holds the key that can unlock your fixed mind. You know what? When I was in the secondary school, our economics teacher, I went, I took economics as one of my subjects. The economics teacher was not teaching us well. We were told that he never went to a mid school. 
When he is teaching, he is moving from window to window. He was never looking at us. If he, wants, he asks a question, he wants you to an, um, answer, he will just break a chalk and throw it. Whoever it hits, you are the person to answer. So I wasn't happy in the class, and I left and went and did government. Fortunately or unfortunately, at the university, economics was part of my, my, my course. And it was so difficult for me to understand what they were doing. I was writing essays instead of using um, um, the, the, the diagrams to explain my points. I failed. I cried my eyes out. But I called on that name. And that name produced the key for me. I sat down, I learned, I read, I got assistance, and in taking the reset, I had an A. That is what God can do in your own life. You may be a failure today. You may be an anointed today. If I should tell you my story, you will be surprised I'm standing here. Praise be unto God. Whilst I was coming here, I had an accident. But glory be to God, I am standing in front of you. Satan's work is to limit us by all means. But I want to assure you that if you will find that Jesus, who holds the key to unlock your locked mind, you will definitely excel and go higher. The sky will not be your limit, but the sky will be your starting point in Jesus' name. You will rise above your peers. You will go beyond limits that you never dreamt of. And Jesus, the same Jesus, will help you to rise above the skies. And you will give him the glory. And he will use you to bless multitudes of people. That is the Jesus I'm talking to you about. We are going to pray. And I want all of us to stand up. I want you to lay your hand on your, on your chest and think deep about how your fixed mind has been. And tell the Lord that, God, I hate this fixed position in which I find myself. Help me. Give me the key. Unlock the fixed mind and help me to grow. Open your mouth and pray to God. I want to hear you praying. You can only impact your world when you have Jesus. Jesus is the change factor. He's the only one that can change you from one position to the other. So please open your mouth and tell God, God, I have locked up my mind. I think I can never move forward. I think I can never succeed. I think I will always be counted first from the bottom. But now I want to be at the top. I want to arise and change my world by unlocking my locked mind. I want to have a growth mindset. I want to develop myself and be what you, God, wants me to be. God created human beings to have dominion over the things he has created. Do you want to have dominion over what God has created? Pray and tell God that, God, I'm here for you. Come and save me. Come and unlock me so that I can excel.
Everybody praise the Lord. Now you know sometimes when we gather like this, many people are lost in the multitude. They say, preacher, preach to us. No, you. I want to preach to you. And I want you to identify yourself, stand out, and say, I am the person going to arise from today. You will arise. You know, we don't do it collectively. We will arise, we will arise. No. Make sure that you yourself, as if I came to get at you. And no matter where you are, I give you my hand, I lift you up. I give you my heart, I carry you not on my back, in my heart. And every time, I will be thinking of you in particular. And today, you and I will go on a journey. We're going to the top. I am going to the top. Father, we come before you with reverence, with expectation, with faith, and with the understanding that as we come today, you will turn every light around in Jesus' name. And I pray everything it takes to take this one single life and hold this single life, lift it up, make it go forward, so that, Lord, as we have been in the valley, we'll get to the mountain top. A change will take place first in the individual, and then you take everyone as a tool, as an instrument to change our world. We know you will do it. We will see the result of the program of this day. Everything we have heard from the beginning to this time, we pray they will be effected and they will be performed in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Another good, good, amen. God bless you. You can sit down. Arise, ready to change your world. Arise, ready to change your world. One, there is a world in us. There is a world in me. There is a world in you. That world in me speaks to me. It tells me, what are you worried about? What do you want to do? Other people are there. Let them do it and just stay where you are. The world in me. The world in me says, what the world outside are doing. Are you not satisfied with that? Leave them. They can invent a plane. Leave them. They can go to the moon. Leave them. They can do the AI. And they can do all the thing that needs to be done. Who needs you anyway? The world in me, number one, has to be changed. And the thing I've given myself into because of the talk within, self-talk. Of the thing that my mind is telling me, that's enough at your age. You have even done better than all the other people before you, that's enough. I need to change the world in me. The world, number two, within me. What does that mean? The world within. My brain, my mind, my concept, my understanding. My limitations, thinking of what's possible, what's not possible. The world of black people. The world of village people, where he came from. 
I need to change, number one, the world in me. Number two, the world within me. There's a third world now. And without number one and number two, you cannot change the world around you. That's where people want to start. And they rise up and they're saying, I'm going to change that. I'm going to change that. The world, the society around them. And the world beyond you. There's a world beyond you. Beyond your locality. And you want to change that world. The world of education. The world of profession. This is the way they've been doing it for centuries. The world around you. And the world beyond you. The people that think this is who they are. And this is what they're going to be for life. You want to arise. And you want to change the world beyond you. It will happen. Maintain that temple. You will maintain the changing power of the Lord inside you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Ready to change the world. Your world. The world in you. The world within you. The world around and beyond you. There are three things I'm looking at. Number one, recognizing the world in you to be changed. Recognizing the world in you to be changed. Change begins at home. Change begins in your heart. Change begins in your life. Change begins right there where you are inside you. Number two, repent of the world within you. Resisting change. You want to look at yourself. There's a world inside you that receives change. And you say, that word, you're not pronouncing it correctly. That's who I am. That's how I pronounce the word. I understand myself. If you don't understand, no problem. You're resisting change. You've been on this for such a long time. Can you turn around? Can you change? If you change, you will climb up. I'm sorry. A fool at 40 is a fool forever. Now tell me, are you telling me you're a fool? Answer me. <laughs> what you say, a fool at 40 is a fool forever. A fool at 70 is a fool forever. A fool at 80 is a fool forever. That's what I've been doing. As it was yesterday, so today, and so forever. You're resisting change. Point number two, repent of the world within you. The world that is resisting change. Number three, number three is ready. The world around, the world beyond you to be changed is beginning this hour. I said it's beginning this hour. Number one, number one, we're looking at recognizing the world in you to be changed. Let me arrange that word, arise. That word arise actually means acknowledge, recognize, increasing sins everywhere arise. What am I arising? There's a concern. Why am I arising? Why am I going from there to there? Because I arise. What does arise mean? For number one, acknowledge, recognize, increasing sins everywhere. And, and that's why you recognize it first. It's increasing in every individual the laziness, the idleness, the crime, the sin, 
the transgression, the evil things of this world increasing. And we recognize that first. And that, we understand, must and will be changed. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It says, He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their hearts. Stop there. He has set in the mind of God, in the creation of God, he has set the world in their hearts. Because he told Adam and Eve, change everything, subdue everything, master everything, and he created a world of vision, a world of power, a world of ability, a world of possibilities. He put that in our heart. And he said, I put this in your heart. I put this in your mind. Now you have the world, the world of vision, and the world of rising and rising until you conquer the earth. He put that in our mind, in our heart. And so, with all that, there is no impossibility. But look at chapter 7, verse 29. In chapter 7, verse 29, Ecclesiastes, it says, Lo, this only have I found that God has made man upright. But they have sought out many inventions. They have sought out many inventions. He put a world of good, a world of power, a world of authority, a world of vision, a world of nothing being impossible. He put that in the earth. But man changed that and he sought out many inventions. And look at Psalm 106, and I'm reading from verse 39. Psalm 106, verse 39, it says thus, they were defiled with their own works, and the world that they put within us of power became the world of uh, impotence, and the world of blindness, and the world of the possibilities that now people, they do not think, we do not think what I can be, what I can do. Because the original creation that he put, all the good things and the practical and the possible things, all the positive things in our heart, now everything is changed. And now people, they defile themselves with their own works. And they went a whoring with their own inventions. Where they invented so many things that hinder us. Many things that stop us. Many things that make us dwarfs in the world. Many things that make us, allow me to use the word, non Entity, non entity. The Lord, in His goodness, in His power, in His creative ability, He put a world of good inside us. But now, a little child begins to grow up on her own. She begins to also devise how to deceive the parents, how to lie, how to do evil, how to steal, how to cheat. And as we're growing up, the world of crime becomes entrenched in our lives. And all the evil that we didn't even see other people doing, we began to do those things. Now, there is a world of crime, a world of sinfulness, a world of transgression, a world of mediocrity that is in us, everyone. And he wants us to start there, recognize the world in you, the world to be changed. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 19. In Mark chapter 4, verse 19, he tells us here, it says, and the cares of this world. The cares of this world. You understand? When God created Adam and Eve, he said, I put everything to take care of you, 
to take care of your health, to take care of your strength. I put everything to take care of you, take care of your hunger, and take care of yourselves. Take care of everything in life. We've turned it around. Now, instead of the world caring for us, instead of creation caring for us, instead of the goodness of God here on earth, caring for us, we've turned around to the cares of the world. And the world is heavy when you carry the world on your shoulder. When you carry the world on your mind, it brings worry, it brings anxiety. And now, our world, the world within us is a world of anxiety. And it's a world of worry. It's a world of pain. All that is now within us. That's why we cannot say we're changing the world except the world in us is changed first. And then it says, and the deceitfulness of riches. Deceitfulness of riches. All that has now come and we're scheming. The ways to be rich and the ways not to work and yet to have more money than we need. That brings crime and that brings stealing. And then it says, and the lost of other things. Now in our heart, that's our world. The world within us. That will be changed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And then it says that... All those things entering in, they choke the world. They choke the world. What does that mean? The promise God gave me, he gave in the world. And now he says, the sky, I'm told today, is not even our limit. The sky is now the springboard from which we launch out to greater things. But that world is choked by the world. Uh, can you think about it? There's a little mosquito there that is, you know, trying to distract your attention. That little mosquito shuts us away from our vision, from our goal. It shuts us away from the good wonderful, delightsome things we need to do. What I'm saying is, you forget you are going to get to the top there. And so that little thing here, that little distraction here, that little desire there, bad, bad things, not too big, just small, shuts us away from the world where to conquer. Now that's why we need to discover what's in me, what's hindering me. What's stopping me? Why am I where I am? What am I thinking in my heart? I know what you think in your heart because you're just like me. When I was your age, I was thinking of where I came from. My father did not study mathematics. My mother did not study mathematics. And I looked up to them. They're great. And I looked up to them. If anybody could be like my father, I think I want to be like my father. And I was kept there. And I can see now in my mind side, the village is now a town, it's now a city. But at that time, the village I came from. Did I see anybody going to university? No, sir. Did I see anybody that had graduated? No, sir. Did I see anybody around me that had studied mathematics? No, sir. And so I was kept like that. And the word I had, the vision I had, and the mountaintop climbing that I had, all the world shut that up. I couldn't think of doing anything until a change came. Your change has come. My change came not because of any preacher. My change came not because of, you know, any mentor. A, a teacher came to our school, 1958. <laughs> you can't calculate that, just listen. And in that 1958, this teacher came. I never knew him before. He never knew me before. Maybe you don't know me. Maybe I don't know you. But in a mathematics class, he gave us some subjects 
and some things to some. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that day, something in me just woke up. Something in you today will wake up. Yeah. The thing inside me, the world within me, had been dormant and dead because my thought is that's the place I came from. And the people that I knew when I was much, much younger, they were all like normal people in our place. And so, but that day, something just woke up in me. The man, the, the teacher did not beat me, he did not correct me, he did not do anything. But when we solved those problems, number one, he gave me 17. Number two, he gave me 17. Number three, he gave me 17. Already he's adding to 51, if you remember your maths. And then number, number four, he gave me 17. Number five, he gave me 17. Number six, he gave me 17. He added up everything together. Add for me. Add for me. Uh-uh. You can't add or you can't uh, multiply 17 times 6. Say it aloud. 102. And he did not subtract anything. He left it like that. God was going to wake me up. God is going to wake you up. And so he came to the class. He took out the papers. He called everybody else. And he didn't call me. And I was thinking, I've blown it again. But I was not surprised. I was not unhappy because I was, you know, at the bottom of the class. And I knew that's my position. And I knew he was going to call my name last. No big deal. And then after distributing the papers to everybody, then he called my name. And I stood up. I thought he was going to say, who are you? Why are you here? What are you doing here? Why did you always blow it? He didn't say that. He said, the whole class, look at this boy. I was a boy at that time. He said he got 102 percent. When the next one got, maybe about, about 68, about 51, and then my class roared and he said mathematician that word woke up something inside me i come to tell you today you are that man you are that woman and i'm passing across to you what woke me up i'm going to wake you up today in the strength of the Lord, in the power of the Lord, you wake up today in Jesus' name. For all the people who are here, I need to tell you that you too, you have a world within you to wake up. You know, I used to think when I was just about 60 years of age, and I said, Lord, how wonderful you are. And at that time, I was looking at 70. And I said, I want to get this done when I'm 70. And once I'm 70, I am through. And then I became 70. And then God began to put vision in my heart at 70. And now I'm 83, and I'm just getting started. Because at every stage in life, there is the world within you. The world, I'm useless, I'm dormant, I can do nothing because now I am 65. And the world confirms that. And they retire you and you're in the cooler. And because you are retired, we ask, brother, what are you going to do now? I don't know yet, I'm retired, I'm in the cooler. You come out today of that cola. Life is just beginning. For you. I said for you. Do not allow 
all the things in the world to stay, to remain inside you and say, I'm coming out of this, you first of all change the world in you so that you will now be able to change others. It will happen. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, looking at verse 2, it says, Wherein in the past he walked according to the course of this world. You walked according to the course of this world. The thinking of the world, the limitations of the world. As we are growing up, even Christians, you, you think about what they say, what they love, what they hate, what they detest, and how they move. And you don't even resist that. It's in you already, according to the course of this world. I want you to think of the principles of the world by which you live, and which hinders you, which makes you not to walk fast, run fast, think fast, plan fast, strategize fast, because that's the way the world is. And once they have, you know, a, a kind of finished secondary school, they say, Am I not lucky? Am I not fortunate? Look at all the people, my age mate. They didn't even finish secondary school. So what am I running for? That is the thinking of the world. And now you go to university and you're able to steal through. And uh, you know, you say, am I not lucky? I remember those people who even finished high school together. Where are they? Now look at where I am. And that's the thinking of the world that makes us to stop. We walk according to the course of this world. And now after you have graduated and, you know, you're looking for a job, you want to earn money. You're, you're in a hurry to earn money. But, you know, money is not everything. You need to move on and move on. And if anything is showing you that you are thinking like the world, you are walking like the world, you are planning like the world, you are retiring like the world, and you are not moving on because the people around you they move on and they don't move on then you are just there I, I even know some people in their families in their communities the people die around 57 60 and they have already got that into their heart into their mind it's part of their world that one died at 56, the other one died at 58, the other one died at 60. And when they are getting near 60, they are already packing up. They are saying, uh, it's coming. That's how it comes to everybody around us here. You are walking according to the course of this world. Of course, when it comes to crime, comes to transgression, and comes to evil, many people say, uh, you know, that's not able, it's not able to overcome secret, who am I? I must smoke. It's not able to overcome alcohol. Who am I? I must drink. They walk according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. But to you, for you, the change has come today. The first thing to do is to look inside you. We in Africa here will say that the man hindering my progress, look inside you. We we'll say that the woman hindering my progress with the occultic power, look within you. It's the world in us that we need to recognize and the world in us that has to change first. The world in you will change. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, For by grace are you saved. Lord, what are you telling me? Do I have to struggle so I can have a change? He says, No, I came to you and you come to me so that I can change that within you. Give me a good amen. amen. First of all, 
He saves us from sin. He saves us from what will ruin us eternally. He forgives our sin. He sets us free from the sin. Number one, he changes us by grace to lift us up out of the well of sin. Number two, he saves us from the society. The society. I cannot begin to tell you. The influence society had on me when I was very young. Before I became born again, I feared them. After all, the society was responsible for my upkeep, for accommodation, for food, for clothing, for everything. And so they controlled me. But then I knew that fear in me attached to people who are mediocre themselves and they are attached to mediocrity. I knew if I continue like that, although I was saved from sin, if I wasn't saved from that society and become totally surrendered, submissive unto God and listening to the voice from heaven that says this is the way to go upward. If I were under their control still, I couldn't help changing the world when the world inside me had not been changed. He saved me. Save me from sin. He will do it for you. Amen. He'll save you from the society. I need another amen there. Yeah. I can tell the society in which I went to secondary school. I knew the principles there. I knew the practice there. I knew the ideology there. How many of our students, fellow students like me at that time, our principal was their role model, but he didn't believe in the grace of God and the goodness of God. He didn't believe in the power that comes from heaven to change us. How to be saved from that society. There are people that need to be saved from substance. You know, the substance they have, the thing to smoke and the thing to drink and the hard drugs and everything and it goes into their brain and the brain with all the, the neutrons and everything there will not be well connected now to go into the future because the substance bucks them down and the substance is from the world and when you drink that and snuff that and smoke that it affects your brain, affects your vision, affects your mind, affects everything. And it has to save you from sin, from society, from substance. There are people that the spirits control their actions. The spirits control their thoughts. The spirits control what they do, what they don't do, where they go, where they don't go, and what they choose and what they do not choose. They don't have themselves. They are bound by those evil spirits, so you might call them demons. And thank the Lord, the Lord saved me from everything. He did it for me, he will do it for you. Today, I said today, the power of the grace of God will come into your life. It will save you from anything that is setting your back. Setting your back. Setting your back. You are free in Jesus' name. How does that happen? You recognize that those things will ruin your life. And you come to the Lord in repentance and say, Lord, I come. I come to be saved. In Jesus' name, He will save you. Give me a good amen. Now, 
what I'm talking about now is that a sin? You know, I used to sleep and sleep and sleep. And if I continue sleeping like that, I wouldn't have been able to make first class in mathematics. You didn't answer that one. You see, Pastor, are you blowing your trumpet? Yes. You're not.